I'd always think that New Yorkers were crazy, right? How can, like, why is everybody all piled into one car and there's this empty car? And I'd be like, New Yorkers are so crazy. And what I would do is go in that car and literally I wanted to cut my throat out because it smelled so bad, right? So I learned that lesson really, really quickly. Well, anyway, got on the subway and there's this guy lying on the floor, like not in a fetal position, but just sort of like on his side. And I'm thinking, what's going on? You know, why is this guy lying on the side and nobody's helping him? So what I did was I shook his feet, you know, and he didn't move. So I took my bag and like put it on the, on the chair and then, um, started to shake him with both hands, like, what's going on? Wake up, wake up. Are you okay? Are you okay? And this guy is not responding. So I made a request that if somebody on the train has signal on their phone that they should call 911, and or if you're close to the conductor's cabin, that you should go into the cabin and tell the conductor that there's an unconscious man here. And so I'm shaking him, shaking him, trying to get some, trying to rouse him a little bit. You know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just thinking it's a human being. Let's just see if I can do something. So anyway, it seems like there's always the, um, the paramedic. There's always, always, I think they're actually angels, right? But there's always this um, paramedic that's off duty, right? So he comes in and he puts his gloves on and starts to rouse this man. And he says, um, did anyone see him fall? And so um, this woman said, yeah, I saw him fall. He fell on the floor, bumped his head and didn't get up. And I said, what? I said, you saw this man fall on the floor, bump his head and not get up and you did nothing? I'm like, people, this is a human being here. So, you know, there's always that one person that just wants to get into it with you. I think he's put there for a reason too, but... So he wanted to get into what we supposed to do. Like, when did this man fall on the floor? The paramedic asked. Oh, well, he fell on the floor at Canal Street. We are now at 14th Street, right? The guy could have been dead. He could have been in a coma. He could have been had a, a, a um, diabetic shock. He could have had narcolepsia. He could have had a heart attack. There's a million things that could have happened to him. But this guy says, well, well, what are we supposed to do? Stop the train for every bum that goes by? I'm like, yeah, if he's in the middle of the train which is unusual you never really see people in the middle of the train you see them lounged on the on the seats but you never see somebody on the floor in the middle of the train of course you stop the train he goes are we supposed to stop the train for every bum this is new york i'm a new yorker i'm like yes it's a human being people how could how is it possible that a person is on the floor mind you it was a young black boy right on the floor and nobody does anything. That's just not acceptable. I was devastated. I mean, literally, I started crying on the spot because it felt like somebody had taken a scrub brush and just rubbed it against my heart that I could not. And I still refuse to believe that. I mean, even though I saw it with my own eyes, I still refuse to believe that New Yorkers are that cold and we're that unfeeling and uncaring and we would just leave a person in the middle of a platform. It's, it's unacceptable. So I'm just going to say that it is critically, listen, it is critically important that we look out for each other. I put that on the internet and two of my friends responded. One has two children. She fell and bumped her head last year, had a brain bleed, was in the subway, needed support. People just walked by her. She woke up in a coma four days later. And what the report said that she was a drug addict and alcoholic, which she doesn't do drugs and she doesn't drink. So I don't understand. Then another friend of mine, she said, I was sitting on the, on the stoop, on the stairs, because I couldn't get up. I didn't have the strength to raise my hand. She's hypoglycemic. She was having an attack and people just walking by her. She goes, if, if it were not for one person that said, can I help you and call the ambulance? She would not have been able to tell that story. So basically all I'm saying is, I am you and you are me. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. And if you can step over another person on the subway that's down on the floor and needs support, people can step over you. And I think that there needs to be some kind of PSA or there needs to be some kind of campaign. And I'm like, do I have to create it? If I have to, then I will. But 
you know, we need to look out for each other. It can't, we can't be that desensitized. So anyway, I'll be right back. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you stuck in a rut? Negative thoughts, feelings, and conversations got you down? Hi, I'm Noreen Sumter, the Potentiator. Tune in every Tuesday, 9 to 10 Eastern Time, and listen for new ideas on my show, Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way, on talkradio.nyc. do you want to connect with? Are you an entrepreneur or intrapreneur looking to build your following? Welcome to our show. Follow Follow Me Friday Friday with Joan and Priya. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern on talkradio.nyc. We're We're your digital connectors. connectors. Woo (laughs) woo! Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day. Got it. So we're back. I mean, I don't know if you heard my little um, rift about that, but I don't think it's a little rift. I think it's really, anyway, let me just say beyond potential live life your way before I go into it because my sister will tell me off. But I really think that it's important that we realize that we're a, New York City is us. New York City is not, I mean, I know I'm sort of going off my topic tonight, but I think it's really important for me to talk about this. You know, I can't talk about smiling and being happy when, you know, we're all shitting over each other in in the city and not caring about each other, you know. I think it's really important. You know, I think New York City is not the buildings, you know. New York City is us because if you take the people out of New York City, all it would be is like, just buildings, right? We are the ones that make the um, the city. And I was having a conversation with this gentleman about uh, New Yorkers, and he was saying that New Yorkers in the world we're labeled as tough people, big and bad and tough, and you know, you know, we got all that. We can give it all that, you know. And uh, the truth of the matter is, we're not. We're cowardly little people. And I charge anyone to. To, to to argue with me on that point. I think that we're cowardly. We can be cowardly little people. And I think on Thursday when I was riding the subway, we were being cowardly little people because we did not care about that human being. You know, nobody cares. I mean, I'm sure there are thousands of stories in this city of people collapsing, needing assistance, and they're not getting it. Or they, you know, people dying. And I heard a story of a man that was riding on the subway back and forth and he was dead, you know, but nobody took a moment to sort of check in and see if that person was okay. Maybe I'm just nosy, you know, but I'd rather be a nosy person that's looking out for the best interest of myself and everyone around us instead of just um, stepping over people. It's inappropriate. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for what we say we want, which is we all say that we want peace on this planet right? But, you know, I used to say, yeah, I want peace on the planet. You know, it's like goodwill to all men, all that, you know, the Christian stuff. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't even know what that actually meant, right? I didn't actually know what peace on the planet meant until I realized, oh, it like kind of dawned on me with all the development work that I've been doing, all the coaching that I've been doing, all the, you know, all, all the things, the development, the life stuff that I've been doing that I'm committed to, that peace on earth starts with me. When I have peace in my soul and peace in my being, I can give peace away to everyone. But until I have that, I can't give it away to anybody else. It's like everything that we need 
is inside of us, right? That even that smile, that happiness that I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to interweave it in, but like the, it's inside of us. It's not outside. And how we access it is to have it come from, it takes courage to shake that man. It took courage for me to shake that man because he could have, you know, young boy, he could have woken up and said to me, or he could have got up and said, leave, leave me the fuck alone. What are you doing? Or he could have, I don't know. He could have punched me in the face. Right. But it's a risk that I had to take. We have to take courage. I mean, yes, he could have had some kind of I know communicable disease if that if I touched him, I disintegrated. But it's a risk that I was willing to take. You know, we have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone, looking good, and a fear of what somebody might say to us if we do a good thing. I would be absolutely full of shit if I talk all this stuff. I'm coaching. I'm supporting people to really live life their way and, you know, really to expand themselves and be personally developed and all that. And that I saw that man on the floor and I did nothing about it. I would have just gone home and hung up my shingle, hung up my, because I was full of shit, right? I literally, I could not, I could not not do anything. It was, for me, it was automatic. I had to do something. I had to do something. And like I said, we are, I am my brother's and sister's keeper. And it doesn't matter if, if he was a, uh, a not neo-Nazi, doesn't matter if he was a drug addict, doesn't matter if he was a homeless person, doesn't matter. He's somebody's son. He's somebody's child. He's somebody's something. And I would not, I could not, and I would not step over that. So I think, uh, I don't know. Am, am I done? Am I done with this? I mean, I cried for three days. I literally, cr I mean, I don't even want to think about it because I cried literally for three days. I cried Thursday when I was with you. And when I got home, I cried again. And um, Saturday morning when I woke up, I cried again. In the afternoon, I, cr I just crying about it because, and it's not even just crying about, you know, for myself, but like, I just refuse to believe that this is who we are as people. And I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that we can be so cold and uncaring and callous that we could just leave a human being to just die on the floor, die on the subway, on the floor like a, I can't even say like an animal because had it been an animal, we would have taken you know, and I'm not saying that animals are not worthy, but life, human life is really worthy. You know, I mean, if we can help an animal, we can help a human being. Um, yeah, that's just my, oh my God. It's, so people like, what are we going to do? What steps are we going to take? How are we going to support each other? I don't know what's going on in the news because I don't read the news and I don't listen to the news. But uh, the cab driver told me that there was a 24 hour kind of <laughs> monitorium made about what we're going to do in Syria. I didn't even know what was going on in, in Syria. But like, first and foremost, we need to mind our own business here. And we need to heal ourselves and get ourselves straight before we start poking our noses in other people's business, right? So I don't really know what's going on over there. And if you do, you want to chime in. If you have anything to say about um, this conversation, call me at 877-480-4120 and chime in. Like, tell me something that's happened to you on the subway. Tell me how we could start like a PSA, um, a campaign to sort of like, help each other on the subway. Like, you know, we have the say something, see something, but that ain't bloody working either. Say something, see something, see something, say something, do something about something on the subway. Right? But nobody's doing anything about that either. I don't even think, we, like I was like on the subway. This is something that happened to me on the subway last year. So I'm on the subway, riding home on the Q train. Da -de -da -de -da -de -do, happy day. You know, it's really nice and sunny. And uh, I see these two people coming towards me. Right. And they're like, did you see that? And, and the other guys, yeah, yeah, she just left it there. Right. And uh, she just left the bag there and walked out, walked off the subway. How's, how could she just leave her bag there and walk off the subway? My ears prick up. I'm like, what? Somebody did what? So she goes, the lady, she just left her bag there and walked off the subway. And so then what did you do? She goes, we came up here. I said, oh, really? I said, so shrapnel, if the bag blows up and the train blows up, it doesn't fly right. It's not going to come down this end. Right. So she said, what do you mean? I said, why didn't you press the button and tell the 
conductor. Well, you know, it was like, I didn't think about it. We didn't, you know, we just sort of got out of the way of the bag. Like, but if there were a bomb or some kind of destructive device in that bag, we're going across the bridge, Manhattan Bridge, water, we'd have all been fucked, basically, you know? So I go into like full steam, like, you know, take action right away. So I'm looking and on the newer trains, there's that button that you can press. There's a button, a little, it, it's not really um, clear what it is, but you can press a button and it goes, it hits and the conductor can hear you. And you tell, I, so I told the conductor, there's a bag. The lady got off the train apparently and left a bag on the chair. So he goes, okay, I'll be right there. Right. So we're going across and, and I'm like, he's not coming. I mean, like, there's got to be, there's got to be more than one person riding on this subway. Right. There's got to be more than one conductor. I'm thinking. <sighs> so we're sort of, you know, not across the water yet, but I buzzed again because I'm getting impatient. Right. So I buzzed again. I said, it's still here. The bag's still here. When are you coming? He says, I can't come. Oh God of mercy. He says, I can't come now. I've got to come when we're in the subway station. Right. So ticking, ticking, ticking. It could have been. Right. So he gets into the subway station and I literally, he literally drags, literally drags his ass up to the carriage. Right. Kind of pokes at the bag a little bit. Right. Looks in. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. Right. Looks in, starts pulling out a scarf and he goes, pokes it a little bit more. Oh, there's nothing in it. It's, it he just takes it and walks off. So mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm at a stop now and a couple of people are like, because I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. I should have gone because it could have been a bomb. But anyway, so, um, so this woman goes to me, you know, I saw the bag. I saw it, you know, but I'm doing the English accent. I'm sorry. <laughs> she didn't speak like that. But she says, I saw the bag, but I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And I said to her, what do you mean you didn't know what to do? She goes, I, I just didn't know what to do. So everybody in that car, literally, we would have been dead, right? because nobody knew what to do. And if they knew what to do, they weren't going to do anything because no, I, I really think that they didn't want to be made to look like an idiot, right? Well, let me tell you, I'd rather look like an idiot and be whole than an idiot and all fucking decapitated, all right? So, so if I've got to say something, I'm going to do it. And it's just unacceptable. I, I, is it unacceptable or is it because we're ignorant? We don't really know what to do or we don't know how to manage ourselves in this situation or are we just sort of looking out for self well i got the subway tough shit if they don't tough shit if that bomb goes off while they're on at least i'm home i mean is it fear that we're i mean we are in trying times i think we're in trying times and we have to be alert to what is going on around us i have to be able to like i said i am your keeper and you are my keeper. I am my brother's and sister's keeper. And if I'm on the subway and I see something weird and funky, I'm going to do what I think is right to do. Press the button, have a conversation, talk to somebody, find a police, do something. But I don't know. I think that on mass, we need some serious PSAs or we need some serious training or we need something. Something is missing in this city. There is way too many of us in this city to not do anything about something and like i would hate to see an emergency in this city the amount of us i mean there'll be some trampled people they are going to be some trampled people and i know we're good all of us are good people at heart because i experienced it in 9 11 right we all came together we all supported each other but we need I, I i personally think that we need to do we need to just be a, a little bit more um supportive of each other I think that, yes, we have our, our all the natural divides, which are the racial di divides, the economic divides, and all those things. We have all those things. But I think that, really, we need to have a human collective. Like last week, I spoke, talked about the socialist collective. We really need to have a human collective where we come together and really support each other. So I'll be right back. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you into comics, movies, and pop culture at large? 
What about music and TV? Then you're in for a treat. This is Michael Dolce, your host on TalkingAlternative.com. I've been professionally writing comic books, screenplays, and music articles for almost 15 years. Catch my show, Secrets of the Sire, at its new primetime slot, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and get the inside scoop on the pop culture universe you love to talk about. For more info, go to SecretsOfTheSire.com. Hello, this is Bruce Chamwalk, host of the Web Design and Technology Coach. Join me and my guests every Tuesday from 8 to 9 p.m. as we discuss the latest in web design, social media marketing, search engine optimization, and technology. We also discuss popular topics including WordPress, making money online, better Google rankings, and more. Every month, we also feature the best unsigned music from around the world right here on talkradio.nyc. Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day. Hello, so we're back. This is Noreen Sumter, Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. At some point tonight, I I will touch on smiling, but right now I'm just touching on, you know, before we can even get to the smile, I want to know, you know, and I I also want to state that I know it's not everybody in this city, and I know that we all do our part in some way in terms of, you know, like, we were just saying somebody falls down the stairs, you know, we do pick them up. Somebody gets lost or something, we do support them. But I think that those are the obvious things, right? Those are the things that we see on a day-to-day. But, you know, we cannot allow fear of what's happening in our country. I say our country even though I am a green card holder, I'm not a full citizen yet. Um We can't allow fear and, um, you know, to stop and kill off our humanity. We just can't. I think we need to, you know, I don't even know what we need to do. I know what, that I'm available to support and help. And I'm all about community. And, you know, but I, I don't know. If anybody's out there and they know what there is that we can do to, you know, have us all be more of a collective rather than just singular beings. Watch and and just really step into. I don't know. I don't. I don't even know how to language this conversation. I really do. I don't. I don't know how to language this conversation. I don't want to be in reaction to it either. I want. I'm really wanting to find a solution, and I don't know what that solution would possibly look like. You know. Um, What's the solution? I'm I'm at a loss. I'm I'm at a loss for words on this one. I really am, you know. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I am at a loss for words. I throw my hands in the air in the air and ask you as my listeners and people that will be listening to this um, um, podcast after it's recorded, what can we do to to actually um Move ourselves forward. I mean, the, you know, the planet is burning, basically. You know, everything is like the ice caps are melting, they say, and the ice caps are melting. Things are going, animals are going extinct. Food has got GMO in it. Um, I'm not having any sex. <laughs> you know, it's the end of the world. What can we do? I mean, like, what can we do to, like, you know, wake us up? Like, wake us all up so that we'll be a collective. I mean, if we, like the taxi driver was saying today, you know, oh, there's like, you know, we, we, what if we go to war? And she goes, you know, you see uh, people blowing, getting blown up all over the world and you see all this stuff. Let me tell you, we had no clue. I don't think, has America ever really experienced 
bombs inside of our country coming from other countries? Have we ever had a war inside of America other than in the beginning, like the Civil War? Have we ever had a real war since then? Huh? Yeah, but was that here or wasn't that in Hawaii? Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking about in America, like in America itself. I mean, I know Hawaii is America. I do know that. It's continental. But have, as America as a whole, have we ever experienced? No. So we can't even, I can't even fathom what a war with bombs dropping in this, in this country or buildings being blown up and things like I can't even fathom. The closest that I've gotten to was 9-11. That was the closest, right? And that was horrific. You know, I have this story that like I it was I'm I'm in the, the city because I was at a B and I meeting. It was seven o'clock in the morning, and I was by Grand Central. And uh, I was came out of the meeting, and one of the guys um, who was in our meeting says, "Oh, ho, 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 the World Trade Center is on fire!" And and I was like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, the World Trade Center is on fire." And I said, "Stop that!" I said, "Why are you being such an idiot? That's really a horrible thing to say." I mean, he, I guess he was in shock. That's why he was laughing like that, right? So I go outside and I look in the bank window and there's the World Trade Center. It's on fire, right? There's like plumes of smoke coming out and it's just, I am just in shock and I don't know what to do because I was supposed to be at a landmark meeting do my um, there at 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, you know, didn't go to that, but I'm like, how am I going to get home? How am I going to, because I have to go across the bridge to get back to Brooklyn. And I'm like, I'm not going downtown. So I go further uptown and I end up in Bloomingdale's, right? Because I had <laughs> still, I still continued on with my chores because I didn't know what else to do. I, I didn't know what else to do. I was like, my mission was wake up in the morning, go to my B&I, go up to Bloomingdale's, return the suit that I had, come back from there, go to my, my landmark thing and do that and then go home, right? Well, I couldn't do the latter part. So I said, let me just still go to Bloomingdale's and um, return the suit, not knowing whether I'll have a body to wear a suit tomorrow, but I didn't know because I just didn't know what was going on. I, I knew that I didn't know what was going on. I knew what was going on, but like I really didn't know what was going on. It's like I did not have a frame of reference for 9-11. I did not have a frame of reference. The closest thing that I came to was, oh, Will Smith is going to save us, right? <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, and I, I've been saying it for like 100 years now, but I was expecting Will Smith. You know, I had this vision that Will Smith is going to fly in in this little helicopter from Independence Day, and he's going to whoop some somebody's ass, right? And I'm, I really, really, really believe that was like, the, that was my frame of reference. Because where in my life have I ever seen that? Where in my life have I ever seen a, a massive building with planes piling into it and just imploding? Never, right? I've seen it on television because Hollywood makes those kinds of movies. So my frame of reference is Will Smith, you know, the rapper. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to ride in and save the day. And I really, truly, I really believed it. Like I believed it because that was my frame of reference. I had nothing else. Right. And uh, so I go to Bloomingdale's and I come out because I can't spend all day in bloody Bloomingdale's, especially they were arguing and fighting and the foreigners were going at it and the Americans were going at it. And people were going at it in, in Bloomingdale's that day. And I was like, dude, we don't even know if we're going to survive the day yet. Can we just like do what we need to do? I, I just was crying. I was devastated. So I come out of there and, and uh, went to get a hot dog because, you know, you got to eat, right? And um, yeah, and that's the reality of it. Even though things are going on like that, you still need to eat. You still need to go to the bathroom. You still need to check in on yourself and all that. So I'm in there getting a hot dog and there's this Indian looking girl and she's crying. And I'm like, oh, are you OK? She goes, I'm really scared. And I'm like, what's going on? She says, I look Indian. I look Arab. They're going to start picking at me. That was real for her. That was real for her that she was going to become now a victim of some kind of attack because she looked Middle Eastern. Right. Because that was what the news was about. It was like Bin Laden and all this kind of stuff had done this. And um, 
I mean, I comforted her for a little bit because, I mean, that's what was going on in the street. Everybody was comforting each other. Strangers were comforting each other. Little people, people were coming together in little groups and stuff and trying to, you know, find a happy medium or trying to get through this thing. And I was like, how am I going to get back to Brooklyn? You know, because I had seen pictures of people, at, you know, um, going across the bridge, but there was all that smoke and soot and some people were covered in ash and there was paper flying everywhere. And I was like, I am not going down and inhaling that shit because like with my lungs and my baby asthma, not baby asthma, baby bronchitis that I suffered with, I was like, I'm not going to turn that back on. So I decided that I was going to stay uptown for a bit and I hooked up with my friend Lori and then we went over to a friend of ours um, house. And while, when I got to his house, I just collapsed on the bed because I was so stressed out. I was so exhausted. My brain, my reticular activator was looking for survival all over the place. I just like got on his bed and just fell asleep because I was just so exhausted. And um, then we got up and went to church because he's Catholic. And I figured I'll go with them to church. I went with them to church. And uh, I, I, um, then on the way back, I saw some people that I knew from my neighborhood. And you know what's so amazing? What I discovered about that, it's like, I knew these people from my neighborhood, right? And you know, we have people that you see in passing on your regular. You might not say hello to them, but you know them and stuff like that. In that moment, everybody was my friend. Everybody was a buddy. Everybody was a buddy to get me home to where I needed to go because it's just, I think that's just how it goes. That's what I've seen in movies. You know, you hook up, you share your bread and do whatever. And um, so I hooked up with them because walking with them made me feel more comf confident and comfortable being able to get on the subway. So I got on the subway. I got on the A train actually. And, um, and I didn't think it was running, but it was running. That's a strong train. That A train is a really, really strong train. And, and I got on a train and there was lots of people on the train. <laughs> but I felt like I was in the twilight zone, right? Because I was sitting next to this lady and I said to her, hey, how, are you okay? And she looked at me like I had five heads, right? Literally, she looked at me like I was five heads. And everywhere I looked on the train, I was like, I had to ask myself, did I die or something? Because, <laughs> no, seriously, it was the weirdest experience. I had to ask myself, did I die or something? Because everybody on this train looks like they're dead or they're like, like, like crazy. They like create, like, no, like, like these were like the people that, that would ride the train anyway, you know? Right. And, but they were, I, I had this conversation about people who are mentally ill, a lot of homeless and stuff like that. Super sensitives is my conversation. They're super sensitive to any kind of activity that happens in the in the in the in the um in new york they're just super sensitive and so they find they they find it the natural occurring is to find a place to survive and so their survival that day was the subway right yeah and so when i got on the train it was like everybody that was on that train including me <laughs> was like like they seemed like they were off their heads or something they, like they weren't present and I was like, am I dead? You know, I had to ask myself, am I dead? Because this is really, but anyway, I made my way home and I didn't get, you know, um, covered in soot or anything like that. Thank God. And uh, yeah, it's just, we don't know what war looks like in this country. We don't, we don't know what, we don't, we have no idea. And I pray to God that we never have an idea of what that looks like. So we'll be right back. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you feeling unhappy with your body, shape, or size? Ever feel out of control with food? 
I'm Elizabeth from Nourish the Soul, and on this show, you will uncover the root to these imbalances and discover a permanent solution to having a healthy relationship to food and your body. Join us every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. TalkingAlternative.com Hi, this is Noreen Sumto from Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. And um, like I, I'm a bit on a bit of a rant today. Um, no, I don't think it's a rant. I think it's just I'm just feeling hyper vigilant and hyper and like I don't have to watch the news to be mindful that, you know, we're in trying times. I think that the conversations that we have we've been having over the last few hours um you know it causes me to feel a little bit like i have to be extra vigilant about what's going on in and around me and you know i grew up in london during the times where we had ira where they would have bombings or like bombings in london and things like that and i just look at the way we do I mean, maybe we're doing some undercover stuff here or some undercover protective stuff that I don't know about. But I know, <clears throat> had that been London and I had told the conductor, well, there wouldn't be one conductor on a big train like that, um, that there was a, 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 um, a bag on the left on the train. I think if I said there's a bag left on the subway in London, oh my God, it would have been shut down in two seconds, right? They would have been like on it in seconds. Um, because we're, we're accustomed to, um, bombs going off since I was a kid, 60s, 70s, I don't know, you know, forever. And we're not accustomed to that kind of stuff here. People have no idea. And even though I never experienced it as a youth, it was on TV all the time. So it's probably drilled into my subconscious, which is to pay attention to your surroundings, no matter what you're doing. So I could be laughing hysterically, having a really great time with my friends and stuff, but I'm still mindful. You know, um, I remember when I was about 16, we had the equivalent of, we had the, uh, I think they were called the Illusion 13, which was, um, we all, you know, a group of youngsters had a party at a house and uh, somebody set fire to the house and locked the door and 13 kids died, right? And so I am always of the mind when I go somewhere, I first I check out where the fire exits are because I want to be able to get out. If there's no fire exit in this place or if it's locked or something, I'm not staying. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm a little bit, even though it's, I know in my own internal self, this is what's happening with me. This is what I'm looking out for. Nobody has to know what I'm doing, but I always want to make sure I can see the fire exits. They're not locked and I can get out because I will not stay anywhere where I don't feel safe. And um, so I'm a little bit vigilant about, um, you know, my sense of safety and the sense of safety, because it's against the law to like lock fire exits and things like that, because you don't want people creeping in and doing extras or whatever. But yeah, I grew up in that time when the IRA was bombing and I guess it's just in my subconscious and like people lying on the floor and being sick and stuff like that. That's just in my humanity. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have you lie on the floor where I can help you out. And if I go through my life um, up until this point, I mean, I've even forgotten so many, there's, I've taken so many people, I've gone with so many people to the hospital, strangers, right? I've gone with so many strangers to the hospital over the time that I've been in New York. It's quite shocking. Um, I remember this young girl, she was on the train, she didn't feel good. And I was sitting next to her and I could see she wasn't well. And I asked her, are you okay? And she says, no. I said, let's get off the train, get on the subway, get on this platform, call the ambulance, call the ambulance, got her to the hospital, stayed with her until her family came. And they wrote me a really nice note. I mean, you know, thanking me for taking care of their daughter. I don't do it because it's just automatic for me. You know, if 
I mean, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I mean, I was supposed to be with um, Ruth at, what, five o'clock. I showed up. What time did I show up? Uh, was it five or five or five ten or something like that? It didn't take much out of my day to do that little action, even though I did stop the train for 15, what, 30 minutes. <laughs> but I think it's worth a life, don't you? I think it's worth a life to, to, to look out for. I'd look out for anybody. And I'm hoping that there's somebody looking out for me. And if I ever need that, uh, that um, angel paramedic on the subway, he'll be there. So anyway, let's just, let's just take the last segment and, <laughs> and talk about like smiling. I think that, um, you know, smiling, right? I'm, I'm talking about a really bad situation that happened on Thursday, but like, even though, I, like I said, my heart felt like it cracked in two, I still can say that overall in my life, I'm happy. You know, I'm happy and I smile. And I think it's really important that we do look at our lives and wonder, am I happy? You know, and am I happy in the choices that I make? And yes, we all have a sense of fear and we all experience fear, but we can't allow fear to take us out. But Again, we have to look at what is the sense of my happiness. I think a smile is worth, like, a, a smile is priceless, actually. It costs you nothing to give one. You know, the person that's receiving it is happy to receive it, feels really good about it. And I think that it's one of those things that's memorable. You know, you walk into a room and you smile. Somebody walks into a room and they're smiling. It literally lights up the room and you have people you know, be attracted to you, you know? So I think it's, you know, you can't, you know, like I said, um, a couple of weeks ago when I was not a couple of weeks ago, last week, um, when I was, um, doing, reading the information out of, um, the, um, how to win friends and influence people. It says that, um, it said that, a, a, a man with a sour face should not own a shop. <laughs> well, I don't think a person with a sour face should own anything. Like, I mean, they, especially if they're just going to have a sour face all the time. And uh, like, I think it's important to have a smile on your face. It makes you feel lighter. I, I remember when I first, um, you know, before I really got like who I was as a human being, my contribution to life and how my energy impacts everybody else. And if I was in a miserable mood, I had it that if I'm in a miserable mood, you're going to be in a miserable mood, right? And it wasn't even that conscious, but it was. It's like in my family, if I was in a bad mood, then don't talk to me because, you know, don't talk to me because, uh, you know, if why are you happy and I'm miserable, right? And that's kind of how it lived for me, but it wasn't necessarily so. I didn't know how to get out of that space. But what I realized is that I can be happy and smiley and still be sad, Right. It doesn't mean that, it just means that I have a sad thing going on. It doesn't mean it's taken over my whole life, right? And I read this thing that it says um, a smile, you can really see a person's smile because it takes up certain muscles in their face. And it also, your eyes gleam in a certain way. It opens up your eyes and you're actually, your smile comes through your face and it comes into your eyes. So a person who's giving like, who's not smiling, they're just going through the motions going, <laughs> hi. <laughs> like you can't there's no connection there's no eye connection there <laughs> right there's no eye connection oh i have to show you the picture that ruth drew for me okay let me pull this over here a second i love this i've been carrying it around let's see if i can find it <laughs> yeah she's on yellow paper for my black friends who that why she got to be white no she's not she's on yellow manila paper she's melina melina right but ruth drew this for me the other day and i just think it was the most funniest thing I've, I've pulled it out and had it on my desk every day since the day you you know created it and i just think it's the most funniest thing is like, i feel like i want to print them and post them all around the city <laughs> But, you know, little things, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be something huge. It's just little things that like this, I appreciate this, right? Because she drew it for me, right? Yeah, to keep me company, right? While I was doing the talk and I had no one to talk to, like I needed one. 
<laughs> but I just thought it was the funniest thing. And I've had it with me every day since last week, Thursday. And so when I'm working, I have it. It's on my desk. It's the funniest thing. But I love that. Little tiny things make a profound difference in the lives of people, especially when people do things for you in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily expect but like you have the i have the freedom enough to say i've been carrying this around for since thursday yeah what is it it's a piece of paper with like you know black marker right and but i think it's the most fun thing and i really love it and i knew that you were thinking about me she was thinking about me when she did it and so it's really i just, i don't know i think it's important to be happy i mean even in light of what's going on in our nation oh my god it's still so important for us to be happy and if we do get into hot water as I, my mother would call it and you know we still have to be happy no matter what you know you got to think about like all the atrocities that have happened throughout the world and throughout time you know people were still happy you know you still had to find that little bit of happiness and i think happiness comes out of your creation it comes out of your mind what you think how you feel about something something it, it's important that we realize that we it's not an external force it's an internal force that comes in and goes out into life so uh, my show was a little bit of a rant tonight but i still think that um we get we did get the part about the happy and you can look at me and be happy <laughs> anyway next week's show who am I having on next week? I can't remember. But next week's show is going to be a really good show. And the next couple of shows um, for the next few months are going to be really, really interesting. Um, we're going to have, I'm not political, but I'm going to have a, a couple of political people come on. Um, I'm going to have Sandra Hicks. I think he's a liberal. And um, Sergey Patel. I think he's a liberal too. So I'm inviting those two guys on so that there's a mashup. Right, they're going to talk. They're, I think they're both vying for the same seat, but different parties. So they're going to be coming on the show. I have a lot of good things happening, and I'm really, really excited about it. And I just want to say thank you to all the people that have been listening to my show since the beginning. And um, I feel very proud and very happy to have you listen. I had a a person write to me last week and said, "I missed the show last week. Oh my god, I was so mad." But she goes, "I'll catch up again." I love that that somebody would actually, it's, uh, it's important that they catch the show. So I just want to say thank you to all the people that have been on the show, people that have, um, you know, that are coming on the show and people that watch the show. And let me, let me know if there's something that you want me to talk about. I'll talk about anything. You know, I'll interview practically anyone. They have to be interesting and they have to be passionate about what they do. So, you know, those are the prerequisites. So let me know if there's anybody that you would like me to or anything that you'd like me to bring on the show. And um, until next week, I wish you the best. And I'm going to give you one order, one charge, which is to look out for your fellow man or woman as you and as we go along this journey in this world. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Thank you.